Whenever I hear the name Ninja Gaiden, I used to think of this. Nowadays, I think of this. In 2004, Team Ninja, the studio behind titles such as Hyrule Warriors, Neo, and Metroid Other M, came out with a revered release, Ninja Gaiden on the original Xbox. Continuing the legacy of the NES trilogy, this 3D action revival of the IP lets you take control of Ryu Hayabusa on his quest for vengeance, and that quest is perhaps best known for being damn brutal. There's no denying it is, and the difficulty is certainly one of its core selling points, but I also think to remember it just for that would be pretty ridiculous. Not only was Ninja Gaiden 2004 impressive for its time, it still holds up well today, and if you're a fan of action games and haven't played this one yet, then what's wrong with you? <laughs> Before we dive in though, I'm technically not reviewing NG04. You see, a year later, the game received an updated version, Ninja Gaiden Black, which includes DLC packs and some other tweaks and additions. I'm honestly not too familiar with all the differences between these two because it seems to be universally agreed upon that Black is superior, so I just play that. The 2004 original is basically irrelevant. Additionally, I'll be talking about Ninja Gaiden Sigma, which is yet another version of the game released for the PlayStation 3 in 2007. Its changes are more sweeping and contentious, however, and I'll address these as we go, but considering Black is an Xbox exclusive and Sigma, the one contained on the Ninja Gaiden Master Collection, it's worth covering both. Ninja Gaiden on the NES was a cool saga of side-scrolling action platformers. As Ryu, you could slash through enemies, use a variety of projectile weapons and magic spells, and climb ceilings and vertical surfaces. He was a fun character to play around with, and stringing together his various moves made you feel like a ninja. Much of this appeal has been carried over to NG04. Ryu cannot freely scale walls anymore since that would be broken in 3D, but he can still run up and along them for a brief period, and also jump off and between them. This this is directly integrated into the combat. You can run along walls to evade attacks, run up one and jump off to get behind an enemy or deliver the smackdown from midair. Levels aren't just fancy looking spaces you fight in here, they are environments you can interact with to approach fights from a variety of different angles. It gives Ninja Gaiden its own sort of combat flair, cause well, you tell me how many other action games allow you to do this shit. Of course, Ryu also has the more standard moves, regular slashes, attacks that launch enemies into the air, kicks that push them away, a guillotine throw, two different kinds of parries you can activate with correct timing, an assortment of aerial techniques, a stabbing death blow when foes are on the ground, etc, etc, most of which can be followed up by one another effortlessly thanks to the fluidity of the overall combat. The quality of the animations is simply outstanding and holds up beautifully and the effect and audio design are incredibly satisfying. Between the sounds of clashing blades, disgusting monsters getting ripped to shreds, the painful battle cries coming from Ryu when he performs physically demanding attacks, there's a real sense of feedback and weight to each connecting hit. The camera will sometimes zoom in briefly and elegantly to highlight flashy moves and finishers, and control-wise and mechanically, Ninja Gaiden is probably the most solid an action game had been up to that point. Every button is completely rebindable to your life not a feature to take for granted back then, and the camera is fully controllable. With the push of a button, it can be centered behind Ryu a la 3D Zelda if you need that instant correction, and Black added the ability to freely rotate and pen using the right analog stick on top of that. There's only what we now consider inverted handling in Black, so that sucks, but Sigma luckily has the option for non-inverted as well. To me, the proper third-person camera makes Ninja Gaiden feel inherently more modern to play compared to many of its contemporaries in the genre. There's no awkward fixed-angle shenanigans with shoddy depth perception or controls switching around on you, and I appreciate the largely consistent viewpoint on my surroundings. The camera is by no means perfect in cramped hallways or whatever, or sometimes when enemies are up close and I'm jumping off of walls and shit. It can feel a bit obstructed or if it's being operated by a drunk horse, and there's one specific complaint I have that I'll return to much later. Even still, the camera is more than workable, and combined with listening for audio cues, I can't say I find myself getting blindsided too often. 
Perhaps a little enemy radar at the bottom could have sealed the deal here, but I think the game's excellent defense mechanics already do a lot of the heavy lifting. In his blocking stance, Ryu actually protects himself against attacks from all sides. He doesn't have to be facing the right direction. And that really helps with potential off-screen ambushes that do happen. Moreover, you can dodge roll by blocking and flicking the analog stick, or even dodge jump by jumping during the roll. Since blocking and dodging are tied to the same button, you can always evade out of the blocking stance and also retaliate back into it after evading. I'm a big fan of this, as both blocking and dodging are defensive options you'll find yourself using constantly as a result, with neither slowing down the pace and flow of combat. Of course, you're not at all invincible because enemies can do things to guard, break, or crush you, and another important detail not to overlook is your commitment to attacks. You can't just cancel out of them, so you gotta be sure about when and how you strike. Think Dark Souls or Monster Hunter, but less extreme. Now, with the speed of a game like Ninja Gaiden, having an engagement ring to your inputs may rustle your jimmies if you're very into your Bayonettas and Metal Gear Risings. Give it a chance though, and I think you'll be able to get accustomed. It's also more forgiving than you would assume initially, because you can hold down a block in the middle of your attack, and should you get hit by something, Ryu will skip the recovery frames that normally follow said attack and defend himself. It wouldn't be an excessive luxury if the game itself communicated this, but at least RZ's got y'all backed up. My Patreon is in the description, by the way. Lastly, the commitment also helps balance out Ryu's arsenal. The Vigurian Flail, for example, is way faster than a fucking unit like the Warhammer, but in exchange, it's not nearly as powerful. On the topic of weapons, I found myself switching between them more frequently than I would have expected. I'm sure the Dragon Sword, your all-rounder, is serviceable for just about anything, but when it comes to crowd control, for instance, I often find myself drawn to the Lunar Staff with its high speed and large range, and against bigger, slower enemies, or if I need to get in as much damage as possible in a short window, I'm typically pulling out something more hefty. Then there's the Unlabored Flawlessness, which can grow up to 200% stronger when Ryu is in critical condition. Not a blade you'll always want to use, but a fascinating one with a risk-reward property that can really pay off if you're feeling confident. You'll notice it's otherwise basically a W-Laro with a few new attack strings, however, and similar similarities can be found in other weapons as well. I've only touched the nunchucks once since the Vigurian Flail seemed far better. The Katetsu is like a weaker dragon sword that you can toss like a boomerang and drain health from foes with, so there isn't as much variety as the sheer number of them suggests. Still, I think there's enough to experiment with. Besides your melee equipment, there are a handful of secondary ranged gadgets that can assist you in a smaller fashion, from smoke bombs that temporarily blind your foes to explosive shurikens that stick to their targets, and each of the different types of your main weapons, if you will, have their own decently extensive combo lists, no doubt a byproduct of the team's history with Dead or Alive, that you can even expand by leveling up the respective tool at the black Smith. If you're on Sigma, you can also obtain the dual katanas, which play quite differently than a single sword, and the combo potential you can extract out of these babies is actually pretty sick. I was gonna point out Nimpo here too, but to say it adds depth would be an overstatement. Excluding the flame wheels that act as an offensive and defensive barrier, all the spells have Ryu anchored to the ground to rest free for a few seconds in order to let out some destructive elemental power. They can save your ass absolutely, but I think we can all agree that imaginative magic applications that properly change the dynamic of fights would have been more compelling. This segues us neatly into some of my gripes I have with the combat mechanics. The first of which is low-hanging fruit, but I'm gonna go there anyway. The game employs a loose automatic lock-on, and nitpicks notwithstanding, this works surprisingly well, all things considered. Ninja Gaiden is very playable, however, from time to time, Ryu, he just... He won't quite be on the same line of thinking as you. I believe he goes for whatever your control stick is pointing closest toward, which, especially when distance is involved, you can imagine, you know, there's some room for error there. A theoretical solution would be a manual hard lock-on that you can toggle, but given the hectic pace of battle and the number of enemies that can swarm you, perhaps it wouldn't be super practical. Nonetheless, I recall situations where an option to override the soft lock-on could have come in handy, and otherwise an on-screen indicator to eliminate the guesswork of of what Arguba Ryu is aiming for would be an acceptable substitute? Let me tell you, this would be a godsend for Flying Swallow in particular. Instead of performing that, if you're slightly off his criteria, Ryu will do this slash to the ground which achieves fuck all if I'm honest, and that adds up to more than you think because Flying Swallow is one hell of a move. 
In fact, I'd argue to a fault, on higher difficulties, enemies are far better at dodging it, leaving you wide open way more, and some straight up counter and punish you if you're too keen on using it, but on normal, that shit's a fairly dominant strategy in a lot of cases. Watch like any playthrough of Ninja Gaiden and I rest my case. Many bosses, on the other hand, are programmed to just deny Flying Swallow at complete random, showing awareness from the developers at least, but this is obviously a poor method of addressing the problem. Not only does this create confusion, it also introduces a certain element of luck into the mix that has no business being there. They really ought to have balanced the move itself better, plain and simple. Attacking down from off of walls as well feels like too much of a cheese tactic. Again, past normal, enemies do make more of an effort to take you down, but generally speaking, it's kind of abusable. If you're in a dicey predicament or on the brink of death, Odds are you could repeat this step over and over to carry yourself through to the other side and make a recovery. I'm not an actual designer though, so don't ask me how to go about fixing this one. I'm only here to bitch and moan about it. Alright, I, I promise, I'll let go off the balancing crap after the following, but uh, charging essence anyone? I think that also should have been tweaked. Whenever an enemy is defeated, they drop one of three colored orbs. Yellow, which is currency, blue, which is health, and red which refills a Nimpo slot. You can choose to either pick them up or let Ryu absorb them by charging his weapon, allowing him, at the cost of the orb's original effect, to unleash an instant ultimate technique. Genuinely, it's a unique and interesting system that encourages on-the-fly decision-making. If you're low on health, for example, do you play it safe and heal, or do you go balls deep and out on the aggression? And the latter ain't free of risks. The charging animation takes a brief time to complete, so you have to position yourself carefully, and enemies need to be in close proximity for the attack to hit, so if you get disrupted or miss, you've just wasted the essence. In many ways, it is balanced, and I love the concept, but being able to chain these is a bit problematic in my opinion. With some skill, you can clear entire rooms of foes by absorbing orbs after one another, and it's often the most effective way too. There's no real penalty for it either, because the faster you kill and the higher your combo, the more yellow essence is rewarded. I'm probably treading dangerous waters now, like I'm hopping around submerged mines, but I really feel enemies touch with a UT shouldn't drop any more essence or something. It would increase the risk-reward factor further, and should you still choose to spam, at least there'd be a punishment in losing tons of currency. Clearly though, the developers were of a different mindset than I am entirely, because this BS is in fact encouraged through the game's ranking system based on karma points. Not only does performing UTs inherently grant you massive amounts of karma points, which makes no sense to me, successfully chaining them is, like I said, usually also the most efficient method of killing enemies, netting you even more points. I don't bother with the ranking system at all as a result, because it heavily pushes you towards a single repetitious style of play that I simply do not find fun. There's no debate for me that an approach such as Devil May Cry 3's, one which also takes item usage and a variety of moves and combos you pull off into account, is superior. In Ninja Gaiden, there is no extrinsic motivation not to chug down potions, and I shake up my combat as much as I do because, well, that's how I enjoy myself the most. I suppose the silver lining here is that the ranks don't contribute to tangible benefits anyway. I mean, there's no yellow essence bonuses or unlockables or whatever. You can't even replay chapters individually, and there's no overview of your ranks to make it feel like you're working toward a goal. It strikes me as missed potential though, and sadly neither Black nor Sigma took the opportunity to tap into it. It's pretty lame too that some of the optional collectibles are missable forever and to a certain extent, I think that diminishes the appeal of going for full completion. Again, a chapter selection could have solved this. They did a good job hiding the items though, the golden scarabs for instance, that you can trade in for a slew of different rewards at the blacksmith. I think tops I found about 45 out of the total 50, and I've never managed to max out my health or magic upgrades. If you want to shoot for 100% without a guide, it looks like you've got your work cut out for you, and I can always appreciate extra content like this. In general, the level design is not too shabby and worth talking about. It's kinda open and Metroidvania-esque, and often requires you to find items to open new sections and progress. In fact, the world as a whole is interconnected, so keys and other knickknacks you find in one area may be needed somewhere else entirely. The capital of the Vigor Empire then, Tyrone, serves as a central hub of sorts that you'll frequently return to in order to access new stages or reach some of the earlier ones if you feel so inclined. By extension, there are moments of mandatory backtracking, but I've never found any of it very bothersome. Half the time there will be new enemies along the way or secrets to find that you previously couldn't get to, and there are even a few unlockable shortcuts that further cut down on travel. It's fun to see how what starts as a large 
large urban city where you feel a little lost on your initial visit, morphs into a much smaller feeling place you're intricately familiar and comfortable with when all is said and done. Should you need it, there is a detailed map for every area in the game to aid in navigation, but I think it speaks to how well designed all the set pieces are that I never had any trouble getting around by myself. Yeah, I know, I'm, I'm pretty epic. I can visualize almost every square inch of the game and how they connect, and it helps that the stages are confined. You'll have to roam around them a bit to find a way forward, but it's never as daunting or with as much backtracking as an actual Metroidvania. Honestly, I kinda miss this era of action games boasting more elaborate world design. Among all the exploration, there are also puzzles to solve and platforming obstacles to overcome. These are probably the less impressive parts about Ninja Gaiden. Puzzles are few and far between, period. There's like one decent one where you move a bunch of platforms around an arena to climb to the top, and I would have liked some more, even if they only let the secrets or something. By contrast, the platforming is better and shows up semi-often, and I dig how non-intrusively hopping between walls is taught to the player. You'll run into a dead end in an alley are simply told, practice makes a wall running perfect, and that moment when the mechanic clicks and you get out through your own experimentation is satisfying. Regrettably though, past this, the platforming doesn't ramp up much, it's not very demanding in precision or timing. These rooms in the tombs with the swinging spike chains are probably the most complex setups, and perhaps that's for the best actually, because Ryu's jumping and parkour controls are, I don't know, finicky, unwieldy, they're passable, not as jank as in Devil May Cry 1, nothing as awful as hopping on the skulls in that game, but when fairly basic jumps and wall running segments prove to be a bit of a struggle now and then, I scream a little internally. Ideally, the platforming controls were smoother, also so that the developers could have created more elaborate challenges around them. All the same, I'm still happy with the overall structure. While combat is the richest and most polished gameplay aspect, chances are I'd grow fatigued if that's all I was doing. The other elements shake things up and it all comes together into a cohesive adventure. The puzzles and platforming may not be anything special, yet they're always brief enough that I do welcome them. I mean, hands up, who's gonna say no to an Indiana Jones boulder chase right before you fight hordes of zombies in the depths of a catacomb? The only nonsense I'd have gladly seen removed is the swimming. It's slow, dull, and of course we have like a 15 minute long chapter dedicated to it. It's a pace breaker, this one, and I'm honestly a bit baffled as to how such a seemingly forward-thinking studio like Team Ninja considered this in any way not garbage. <laughs> To give credit where it's due, Sigma does streamline this chapter a fair amount. It's shorter, especially if you ignore optional junk, there are actually hazards to dodge while underwater, and they added some on-land combat that was absent in black. It remains one of my least favorite sections, but is more tolerable to replay here. However, this is what's so funky about Sigma. For every arguably good change it makes, it makes an arguably bad one to offset. In an effort to cut fat, I suppose, it throws out or simplifies multiple rooms of content that I think were totally fine. But in Chapter 2, for instance, it turns the village burning sequence, merely a cutscene in black, into something playable with the boss battle at the end. I'd say that's an improvement and a graceful, natural way of extending the level, recontextualizing a key event in a more interactive manner. Then, on the flip side again, Sigma contains three chapters where you play as Rachel, which is not as hot as it looks because they're basically truncated versions of Ryu stages. Plus, Rachel herself has limited capabilities in interacting with walls, can only use her Warhammer with no access to a lighter weight weapon, and doesn't have many notable abilities of her own. Case in point, she's a watered-down, less versatile Ryu, and so her segments come across as filler. She gets one unique boss encounter, and that's all she wrote. This stuff should have been optional, so you aren't forced to break away from Ryu on every single playthrough. And listen, there are more alterations from Black to Sigma we haven't gone over, but I'll leave the full rabbit hole to go down for that remake or rebreak guy. Bottom line, the two trade blows for superior release, and how that averages out is pretty subjective. I'd be remiss not to mention Sigma does also add a few extra checkpoints and shops, but this doesn't have much of an impact on the overall experience if you ask me. You're still getting most of the same challenge as in Black. 
And this is vital because the challenge is of course integral to Ninja Gaiden. Even if I did complain before about some of the moves being a bit OP, it's not so blatant that it cripples everything. If you're new to the game, then be prepared to kick the bucket regardless. A lot of this boils down to the enemy design. The enemies are aggressive and simply relentless in their pursuit to make you a dead man. They will come rushing toward you, shoot or throw shit at you, grab you if you don't keep moving, and more often than not, you're dealing with a group. In Chapter 2, for instance, you take on samurais while a magician is constantly teleporting around and blasting projectiles your way. You gotta pay attention to each of these threats, anticipate and time your dodges around the projectiles, as you are also trying to crush the samurai's defenses and get rid of them. Managing these kinds of situations, defending yourself, and finding opportunities to sneak in damage or a combo is the name of the game, and it's an exhilarating one because one wrong move can easily cost you a ton of health or your life completely. If you get reckless, if you don't properly learn from your mistakes and study enemy behavior and telegraphs, you're going to continually bite the dust and run into that game over screen. These are the cold facts, but I want to stress this is not some obscenely hard Kaizo that you should be too scared of touching. Sure, you'll want to rip off your pubic hair with a roll of duct tape on like very hard and master ninja difficulties, but on normal it's reasonable. Tough, but reasonable. There's a good amount of elixirs dispersed among the world, and a shop is almost always accessible in any given chapter where you can buy more supplies should you run out. There are no lives to speak of, and while checkpoints can certainly be far apart to ratchet up the tension, the vast majority of bosses have one right around the corner. You won't be getting sent back three stages here when dying once in a three-part long final boss, that's for sure. Enemy placement is well thought out too, and there's no dumbass knockback that'll have you careening into pits. By and large, I think NGO4 is fair no matter the difficulty setting, and any player halfway decent at action titles should be able to finish it on normal with persistence. That's not to say there won't be anything that'll get on your nerves or feel a bit cheap. For me, a big one is the aforementioned enemy grabs. A lot of them are unbreakable and not telegraphed, which I don't mind inherently since you're a ninja and you shouldn't stand still for too long. However, once in a while I happen to land in front of somebody and they insta-grab me with nothing I could've really done about it. It's not frequent enough to be a serious issue, but I do wish the AI was tweaked to make grabs more reliably avoidable, or that you could maybe break out of them in some way if you're quick and skilled enough. Perhaps you're expecting me to rant about the ghost fish here as well, but eh, for as notorious as they are, I'd expect worse. These bastards bite onto Ryu and have you button mash to escape their grip. They can be pretty fucking annoying if you don't have a strategy for them, but you're also told outright what weapon to use against them. As such, I don't find the ghost fish so much frustrating as I find them uninteresting, because once you figured out the trick, they become a non-threat basically. On that note, there are some other enemies I'm not too fond of fighting for similar reasons, mostly the bigger ones. It just kinda becomes a game of backing off, waiting for a safe opening window to punish, and repeating the cycle. They do make, for contrast, compared to all the hectic mayhem, but I usually feel compelled to skip past them when I can. I think these larger enemies work best in packs or when they co operate with the nimble smaller ones, because taking down anything becomes more involved and complex when you have multiple threats to contend with at the same time. The positive news is, much of the game focuses on the type of high-speed, frantic combat scenarios I prefer, and there's a healthy variety in terms of enemies there. Even better, higher difficulties will pit you against new or upgraded opponents not previously seen. For example, among others, Hard introduces these deadly grey cats that love to swing around your neck, and the cyborg dudes with hardened defenses, carrying weapons ranging from lightsabers to grenade launchers. No idea what high-tech robot police are doing in a Middle Eastern town, but okay. <laughs> Next to enemy types, enemy arrangements are also mixed up substantially. The toughest white ninjas at the end of chapter 1 on normal are merely a common foe on very hard, and often accompanied by the even more dangerous purple samurais, and where you previously may have faced a very small group of already tricky black ninjas, now there might be a short wave of black cats that are even more evasive than the grey ones, along with the orange ninjas who dish out significantly more pain. These sorts of changes are all over, and make each scale up in difficulty mode a relatively fresh affair. They aren't only modifying damage dealt and received and limiting the resources you can carry, and I really admire that. Special shoutouts here to Ryu's fiend doppelganger who shows up from hard onward. His AI is relentless, and as such he'll provide you with straight one-on-one -on -one slugfests. These are truly not over until they're over, but all the same I find them fair because any unexpected harsh stunt he pulls on you, 9 times out of 10 you can perform the exact same on him. The arenas are 
pretty open and elaborate as well, so you've got a lot of space to operate in and potentially use to your advantage. It feels awesome when you're doing well and nailing the moves, almost like you're playing out a ninja movie. That said, screw that one encounter where he's using the Vigorian Flail. He can bullshit combo your ass in the air and zap loads of health with no chance to break free, yet no matter how much I tried, I couldn't do the same on him. It kinda ruins this fight specifically, not gonna lie. <laughs> By far the most questionable aspect of the higher difficulties to me, however, is the addition of minions to boss battles. In concept, I think it's very cool, but the camera is not equipped to handle it half the time and should have been overhauled to accommodate. Sometimes, the minions can be so swift on their feet and all over the place, and the game is so concerned with keeping the boss dead center in frame that the whole shebang becomes a clusterfuck. This is the most recurring camera struggle I've faced. I've outright died from it on multiple occasions, and was even robbed of a priceless W by some off-screen surprise attack. This battle saw me climbing back with the odds well stacked against me. I really activated my Surprise, gamer mode here, so I deserved better, damn it. Thankfully, in other instances, you get a wider shot that allows you to reasonably oversee everything, or maybe you don't always, but the minions at least remain stationary. Situations like these are fine and seem to properly realize what the developers were going for. The best example is the Chapter 2 boss. You're on a straight bridge with a loose camera you can quickly flick either direction, and the minions merely warp around and shoot projectiles. There's multiple approaches you can take, from solely focusing on main horse dew to getting rid of the minions immediately whenever they spawn, and you've got both a sword and arrows at your disposal to get the job done. To me, the encounter is so great that it rises above any jank it may have. Fortunately, I actually like many of the bosses on their own. Unless you plan to potion scum, you cannot just wail on them and expect victory through sheer brute force and luck. Many of them will block your attacks and or severely damage you if you get too close and don't know what you're doing. Whenever you encounter a new boss, your first order of business is carefully observing all their patterns and moves, and possibly how their AI reacts when you approach them. In doing so, you'll learn to gauge and intuit the best way and time to strike, eventually to a point you can get through with minimal to no item use. I remember getting game overs embarrassingly often against the likes of Dynamo and Doku on my first playthrough, whereas now I can beat them pretty consistently on most difficulties without opening the pause menu once. I sorta of dogged on fighting large larger enemies even though they have parallels with the bosses, but I'm ultimately more engaged with the latter because 1. You typically only run into them once or maybe a second time with the twist, and 2. There's more complexity to them. The road to mastery is more engaging and rewarding as a result. Now, I also gotta be realistic, so I'm not gonna sit here and pretend all the bosses are spectacular. There are ones of lesser quality too. Simon says, 200 inch penis monsters, anybody? <laughs> They're pathetically easy to read, and for no discernible reason, Team Ninja thought it was necessary to have three variations of this same boring concept, as if two wasn't sufficient. There are also the tank and helicopter showdowns at the military supply base, which revolve around avoiding repeated cycles of machine guns and rocket launchers launchers, sneaking in hits using the bow, and maintaining your ammo. They're really simplistic in nature, but not bad or even pushovers necessarily, and since they're followed up by one another, I think they at least make for a fun pair of memorable set pieces. To cut to the chase though, if I had to nail down my most disliked boss, it has to be Awakened Elma, which is ironic. Normal Elma is one of my favorites, because while she is unhinged and unforgiving, all her tricks are reliably dodgeable with correct positioning and foresight, and I was able to to derive a few strategies I could switch between to damage her with decent consistency. The outcome is a mighty intense tug-of-war endurance battle that requires your A-game more than any other boss. Awakened Alma, on the other hand, has a projectile attack that I swear is impossible to circumvent sometimes, and if there is a method to hit her without taking damage, then fuck me sideways, because I couldn't figure out a single one for the life of me. As far as I can tell, Flying Swallow is your only bet, and that's terrible if you recall the lottery that is landing the thing. Ugh, I hate Awakened Alma. That being said, on the whole, the bosses get my approval, and if you want to tackle them in a variety of remixed ways, the unlockable mission mode is something you should check out. In there, bosses can be grouped with some of the most dangerous enemies, or put in a different setting altogether that changes how you approach them. The military tank in the middle of the streets of Tyrone that can barely house it, for example. And towards the end, they even start teaming up. 
This was X-Challenge before X-Challenge. The poor camera has no clue what to do with itself, but I can't deny its endearing as off-the-wall lunacy for the dedicated masochists. Not only that, Mission Mode also has a surplus of common enemy gauntlets, and the difficulty for all of this is significantly higher than the regular game. Not all the missions are noteworthy, but it's quite a beefy mode with 50 pieces in total, and there's enough good to see most of it through. They clearly put effort into this, it's not some mindless shallow bonus content. From what I've sampled, Sigma even replaces about half of the missions with new ones, so who knows what other magnificent sauce is lurking behind all these question marks. I know, shame on me for not finishing all 50 of them again, but I have a life to get back to after recording like 60 hours of gameplay for this video. Let me off the hook, man. I hope this goes to show, though, that while the ranking system blows and won't have you coming back for more, between the substantially altered difficulties and now mission mode, there's plenty of replay value and stuff to sink your teeth into. Ninja Gaiden is a meaty package and feels like a fully developed AAA title. The main adventure clocks in at roughly twice as long as Devil May Cry 1 for reference, and it's evident a lot of care and attention went into the production. Not only in terms of gameplay, but the graphics are also some of the most, if not the most, technically accomplished for that era. As somebody who grew up on PS2 and GameCube, goddamn, I am kinda floored by how impressive this game looks on Xbox. Barring the 480p resolution, I could have mistaken it for an early 360 release. It's crazy out here. When put next to Metroid Prime or Resident Evil 4, both of which are often praised for their state-of-the-art visuals, it's evident that Ninja Gaiden and the power of the original Xbox are a step above. Character models are simply top-notch, textures still look fairly sharp and detailed, the effects and particle work are amazing, and what stood out to me the most are the slick reflections in marbled floors, streams of water, and the like. All of this is achieved in widescreen that properly extends the field of view rather than crop the top and bottom, and at an uncompromised, near-flawless 60 frames per second. You'll encounter bouts of slowdown and a bit of screen tearing here and there, but it's minimal in the grand scheme of things and easy to forgive, considering the game hardly ever needs to load in the middle of a chapter. It's phenomenal, really, but I also think it's fair to say that most people, including myself, will gravitate more towards Sigma here because it's noticeably more colorful with deeper contrasts, giving the visuals that last push they needed to look truly pleasant and almost timeless, I feel. And it's safe to assume the Xbox was not a limitation in this, was it? Seems like an artistic choice more than anything. Though obviously, as you'd expect, there are technical enhancements as well. Higher resolution textures, some nice extra flourishes, like the leaves falling down in Chapter 1, a moderate amount of bloom lighting that doesn't overpower the image, yada yada yada. The PS3 version also renders at a full native 1280 by 720p and even manages to maintain a pretty stable 60fps, albeit again with the occasional screen tearing. As a result, I'd say Sigma has aged pretty darn well by 360 and PS3 standards. There are more load points than on Xbox and they're longer to begin with, even with data installed to the hard drive, which is kind of regrettable, but not too bad given how short and infrequent loading used to be. That said, the biggest problem I found is that the game tends to, like, skip sometimes, particularly during cutscenes. You're much more powerful than just a human. My strength comes from training, not from some curse in my blood. Are you so sure of that? It's very strange and kind of a blemish to be honest, but I wouldn't say it's a deal breaker. What is a deal breaker is that Sigma fucking ruins the music. Actually, it's another mixed bag. <laughs> yeah, so Sigma changes the music here and there and it's hit or miss. Some of the replacement tracks I took to a little more. Others, I think, are better originally in black. Like, geez, a little in your face for the first two enemies, don't you think? But much like the games themselves, it's not a huge deal either way. A great chunk of the soundtrack is left untouched in the first place, and speaking of that soundtrack, it's a solid selection. I do believe there are memorable tunes here and a handful of real standouts. The rock and military one I used at the start of the video is certainly one of the highlights, and furthermore, there's Pray to God. Alma Awakened. <laughs> and 
and under alert. Bear in mind, those aren't the only tracks I enjoyed by a long shot, but let's not drag out the video with 30 minutes of music, shall we? It's a well-rounded score that can be action-packed, atmospheric, or even pretty somber and melancholy when appropriate. Just look at this scene, and I think the background piece perfectly conveys and supports the context of what's going on. What I find to be a shame then is that I can feel the emotional weight in this music, but the story itself doesn't really hit. Plot-wise, Ryu's home village is raided by a force seeking the Dark Dragon Blade, an evil blade with the potential to cause endless death and suffering. This blade lay dormant under the protection of the Hayabusa clan, and as it gets stolen and most of the town is burned down, Ryu has one simple goal. Retrieve the Dark Dragon Blade and avenge his murdered clan. It's an effective setup on paper, however, as the player, I have no established connection to Ryu's people. You never see what the village and its folks were like before destruction, lessening the impact of the scenes that involve the village, and by extension making the surrounding journey feel not as personal to the player. Now, perhaps establishing that connection would have made the game's opening too slow, which is fair enough, but then my problem is Ryu himself. He does have an attachment to, and I presume, memories of all the people he lost, so if we could empathize with him and his inner turmoil, that would go a long way already. Sadly, we're shit out of luck there too, because Ryu is a very stoic and self-serious man. Evidently, something must be driving him, and you can see the hatred in his eyes whenever the name Doku, the leader of the attack on his home, is mentioned. I'm looking for a greater fiend named Doku. Do you know him? Why are you looking for him? I'm going to kill him. That's the most you'll ever get from him though, I mean, I get it, he's a cold, calculated ninja and it was clearly intentional, but nevertheless it's hard to feel invested in somebody who displays less emotion than my boy King K on streams. Doesn't help that Ryu's got no charisma or much of any personality on the whole, making him kinda boring compared to most other action game protagonists that bring their own unique energy to the table. Surely they could have injected some character and vulnerability into this guy without taking away from his badass stature? If you've played the NES trilogy, you'd also know Ryu was more expressive there, so I'm not sure why Team Ninja didn't stay more true to that. As weird as it sounds, I think Rachel is actually more interesting between the two. One could argue it's just my dick convincing me of that, but I will not entertain this idea. Rachel is more inclined to share her pain and motivation with Ryu, that being that she became a hunter to kill her sister, Elma, who was cursed into a monster. Elma is also a boss you fight, so all that combined is easier to relate to Rachel, and she's visibly upset not only in the way she talks about Elma, but also when she can't bring herself to kill Elma when the opportunity finally presents itself. See, I I'm not as superficial as you think. Goofs and gaffs aside, uh, Rachel isn't even a deep character and doesn't get as much screen time as I would've liked to develop her further because she frequently gets her ass beat and kidnapped, so the fact I wanna say I cared about her and Alma the most is a little telling. Due to Ryu's demeanor, there's no sense of chemistry between him and Rachel either. Seriously, they have less of it than Ratchet and Clank do in the PS4 game. He led her down the path of evil, and she succumbed. Fiends are pitiful beings, destined to live forever, slaves to the forces of evil. And there's only one way to release them. To kill them. Alright, I couldn't even say that with a straight face. Still, even at the very end, when the day has been saved and the sun rises, Ryu just ignores Rachel's concerns and affection, goes, it's over and leaves? <laughs> Truly, few fucks were given here, and speaking of the very end, I gotta say, the game goes out on a whimper. You see, I quite like Doku as a villain. He's got a wicked design, for starters, with that burning blue flame for a face behind the mask. Simply oozes mystique, and he leaves an intimidating impression when he beheads members of the Hayabusa clan and kills Ryu during the invasion. At least, that's sure what it looks like, but the very next chapter, Ryu is all up and ready for revenge. Is he like Dante, that he can be pierced by a sword and just wring his body out of it. Regardless, you also learn later on that Doku is the one responsible for cursing Alma, Ryu is warned on multiple accounts not to mess with him, and so there's real build-up to their inevitable re-encounter. Classic setup and payoff. 
The thing is, Doku isn't the main antagonist. He's only the servant of an evil god monster, the Vigur Emperor. A typical trope, you're taking on the ancient evil after overcoming everything else, and I can see the appeal. It's just, to me, abstract entities that want to become supreme deities because, of course, often feel random and uninspired. Look, I beat Doku and there's a sense of satisfaction when finally killing that punk. I beat the Vigur Emperor and I'm about as enthused as Ryu himself. I'd probably have preferred if they further fleshed out Doku with maybe a compelling background and purpose. And you know, this is something I could overlook, but then I got to the final, final boss and just... No. <laughs> Over the course of the adventure, there's a few cutscenes where this mysterious man with the cape and his advisor Gamoth are expressing their desire to obtain the Dark Dragon Sword. After defeating the Vigor Emperor, this cape man is revealed to be Murai, Ryu's late uncle you trained against in Chapter 1. While that sounds like a juicy twist, it frankly wasn't impactful at all. In retrospect, the foreshadowing is certainly there, so it doesn't come completely out of left field, yet it feels like it does all the same, because you last saw Murai in Chapter 2 and have probably forgotten he even exists. Furthermore, you would think Murai and Ryu would have some words to exchange with one another, considering how close they are, to heighten the tension and create an epic climax and all that. But no, instead, Murai doesn't explain anything, Ryu doesn't ask anything, and once the battle is over, Murai, like, falls into an abyss and Ryu doesn't seem to reflect on it in the slightest. The whole affair just kinda happens and rings hollow as a result, which is so disappointing. I'll give him this though, Mirai obliterating Gamoth for no real reason other than to be a cunt is pretty based at least. You've done well, Gamoth. Huh? Huh? <laughs> Anyway, had Mirai played a more significant role throughout the story, I have no doubt the twist that he's been manipulating you all along for his own pursuit of power would have landed a lot better, not to mention the finale of the game would not have felt as forgettable and slapdash as it does. That's how I'd sum up the story as a whole, really. Promising ideas with potential, lackluster execution. Maybe I'm in the minority for even caring. This is a tough as nails action games where gameplay is most important, right? But remember, Ninja Gaiden on the NES was pushing boundaries here. Cuts scenes are highly cinematic for the platform, and the stories, though obviously basic when viewed through a modern lens, have more depth to them than almost any contemporary that isn't an RPG or something. For their time, they were remarkable. It's clear NGO4 still put the same effort into its presentation, and there's almost an hour's worth of cutscenes. Both in engine and pre-rendered, the animation is great by 2004 standards, and the English dialogue is properly lip-synced, which is commendable considering that's still not always the case for Japanese-developed titles even today. It's just a bummer the actual content and substance of the cutscenes doesn't live up to this presentation. I know for me personally, a strong story can definitely elevate a game further and give it more of a lasting impression. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why something like Devil May Cry 3, featuring characters with actual character, quotable dialogue and memorable cutscenes, is still remembered so fondly by the masses, whereas Ninja Gaiden merely has a small cult following these days, despite selling very well and receiving critical acclaim across all three of its releases. Releases. And putting aside my story critiques, earned those sales and reception, I'd say it did. Ninja Gaiden was undeniably ahead of the curve in terms of mechanics, and you can't help but respect what Team Ninja managed to accomplish here. The combat remains smooth, fast, visceral, and the overall experience is nicely paced with solid level design and exploration. There are flaws, a couple of aspects newer players might find dated, and a few weaker sections, so I wouldn't go into Ninja Gaiden expecting still the best action game ever made. Made, but if you're a fan of the genre or simply itching for a challenge, I can only recommend checking it out. Black or Sigma, I think both are perfectly fine choices. Black is a bit tighter since there's no Rachel chapters and as such probably my go-to, but Sigma's got the more attractive looks and the other small ways in which it's inferior are mostly details only the hardcore seem very bothered by. Basically, get whatever version is most convenient for you and enjoy a classic, because Ninja Gaiden is easily one of the best titles of the original Xbox library. If I never upload another video again though, the Koei Tecmo Ninjas probably came for me because I illegally recorded and reviewed their game and I'm in jail. Just a heads up in advance. Yo, thanks for watching the video, I hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to keep up with me a little more, feel free to follow my Twitch. I stream on there once in a while, so you can come hang out and chat if that sounds interesting to you. That's it, uh, bye bye